Hi, hello. Welcome to Telugu NRA Radio Wednesday Immigration Show. Every every Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Central Time, with attorney Lucas Garriston from Burgos and Laws Firm. So we are coming every week on Wednesday to bring the more info, more in USA immigration updates and um, and future the information what will happen or what new rules are which uh, be clarify in this uh, every every week week Wednesday show. Today we brought up. Uh, a couple of topics and uh, we will discuss with uh, Lucas and uh, uh, I think uh, we had a good news on yesterday Biden took or maybe Biden signed on the Trump um, initiated uh, rule and um, more interesting updates will get from Lucas we will welcome to Lucas to the show hi Lucas good evening how are I you think that I'm doing well, Venkat. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for all the our viewers for tuning in this week at the same time, six o'clock on every Wednesday. Yeah. So, Lucas, um, today we gonna discuss about the October filing 485 adjustment adjustment of status and the 2021 cap process. And also, we got a lot of uh, inquiries and uh, we saw a lot of um, issues on 485 rejection and different uh, WhatsApp groups. And uh, maybe we will try more questions or more information. We will touch more information on 485 adjustment of derivative files got rejected. Right. So we can go for step by step and uh, yeah, I want to hear the good news from you. What is the good news? Well, the good news is, as of yesterday, it's officially uh, withdrawn the challenge from the Trump administration to uh, withdraw H4 EAD. So we can now all rest, uh, you know, at night knowing that the program is still going to be ena uh, enacted for, you know, the foreseeable future. And, um, you know, again, for those who might not understand what H4 EAD is, uh, you know, uh, H4 is a derivative uh, benefit or beneficiary of a principal H1B uh, immigrant, usually a spouse uh, or child. And then the EAD allows a person who uh, is in H4 status if the principal non immigrant has an approved I 140 and the visa uh, for the GC is not yet available. Uh, the spouse can go ahead and apply for employment authorization. Uh, so this helps, uh, you know, uh, family unity, uh, uh, increased income for the family, more more support that way. And, um, you know, the whole purpose of the program was uh, centered towards people who are stuck on these uh, horrendous backlogs, uh, waiting at EB2, EB3 categories. So now, you know, it's a good victory moving in the right direction, keeping H4EAD, but hopefully this year, uh, if things progress like we expect them to, we won't need that, you know, as much in the future because we'll be able to address this humongous backlog uh, that's been pending for some time. Okay. So, it meant so Trump uh, brought this new rule on uh, 2019, I think, end of the e e H4 EAD to end. But luckily, Biden move forward as a good 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 approach good 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 step to take and so a lot of uh, h1 ho h1 h4 h4 holders happily work what they pursue or what they desire to work on and um respect to the working right. so so is h4 ead we are talking about the h4 and h4 ead the still we are in a situation who applied the H4 application, but uh, still under process. It's taking the longer time. It's taking the f more than six months and uh, get the EAD. What do you think uh, Biden will remove the biometric? Even I see uh, maybe one uh, tweeting or something 
will hear the good news on H4 EAD. Uh, do you have any information about um, the biometric and uh, the future H4 EAD process? Make it, it, make process even faster to get EAD. Well, you know that's a good question. Right now, I haven't heard any news officially of what would happen to uh, streamline the the application process, much like how they used to be. Uh, three or four years ago. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, at, at this time, we had a, a huge influx of people filing, um, you know, their GC cases. And all of the GC cases are going to require biometrics also. So, you know, we just increased the, the line by 20,000 plus, <laughs> you know, uh, with all these recent filings. So, unfortunately, for H4 EAD, the process has been long, it's been getting longer, and now we can expect it to still progressively get longer due to the recent filings. So, you know, it's a short-term uh, pain uh, that we have to endure, but long-term, I, I believe that this is something that will be addressed and, and fixed. Okay. Yeah, Lucas, uh, we can discuss um, H4 and H4 EAD related, maybe after some time, the show. Then we can come to the H4, H1B cap, the mm -hmm. final rule. The president passed uh, 60 days, right? It means, can you give the more information on the one? Correct. So there's been a few policies right now, the regulations, uh, rules that went into effect. Um, and the president across the board, the first state office, you know, did a 60 day uh, pause so to speak, on it, the implementation of these rules. Now, DOL has already started the process of removing their final rule that had the wage rates increasing, the definition of an employer, employee relationship, uh, et cetera. And what we've done is now, uh, can you see me? Yes. I'm sorry. All right, so what we've done now is uh, uh, focus on um, – there we are. Uh, um, I'm, I apologize. I lost my train of thought. So we're talking about uh, the final rule H one B cap. Uh, correct. Six so the, the DOL rule was rescinded, and they they you know the administration has published a, a final rule to remove that rule, and. Um, which is good news. Now, the H-1B fiscal year 2022 cap can still be impacted by this new rule. Uh, however, it seems like, uh, you know, and, and this is something that I think most people can appreciate uh, moving forward from what we've endured the past four years is it's a responsible person or leader who goes into a term and will look at the evidence of what the program uh needs look at what the history of the program has been and look at to the future of what the program should be and i think it's irresponsible for someone to just uh go in and just say i'm going to change everything back just because the previous president changed it to this way and i and i think that's what we're seeing right now so there's some rules that we know just are outside the scope of what congress intended those rules have already been uh, in the process are in the process of being rescinded. Uh, the H one B cap rule is, I think, still under review as far as the, the determination of what to do, and that's more or less what this sixty days allows. Now, I firmly believe that the rule will ultimately not be implemented in in regards to this year's cap or in the future year's caps. But we still have to be prepared, and we still have to be ready that um, you know we don't want to wait till the end of the 60 days which would be right at the beginning of the registration period for h was h1b registration and, and then be completely caught off guard with some new process or procedure so it is still kind of uh you know doing double work but we always want to be prepared so we don't have any issues okay so as we are discussing about the h1 cap um the information the word, what do you think this uh, 2022 H1B cap random process will get the random process or it means as I don't see last one week uh, any update on H1 H1B cap. Can you share if you have 
which process is going to be implemented by March for 2022 cap? I would say, you know, the, the traditional random selection process is probably the one that's going to go at the end of the day. I mean, that's a very high probability of what's going to happen. Uh, there's nothing official yet, so we can't say officially, yes, this will happen or not. But we have to, um, you know, just wait and see how the agencies and the administration handle the, the change and, and what the processes uh, will be. Now, another, another thing we need to look at is um, it, yeah. this year, due to last year and everything that happened, uh, with the registration process, uh, along with other changes to, you know, current current uh, regulations and memos and things like that, you know, there was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, cases filed and approvals. And I think this year we're going to see a continued increase in filings. And uh, I think that, you know, uh, cr the current system that's being used is the one that's the best suited for this. So, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll just have to wait and see uh, how everything goes. Okay. So let uh, we come to the October adjustment of status of filing. So what is the status um, as who applied in October 2020? adjustment of status. So do you see all our got uh, receipt numbers or do you see any rejections? If you see any rejections, what is the reasons? So as we've discussed in weeks past, I think, you know, obviously this agency works on a FIFO system, which means first in, first out. So of all the cases we filed in the first part of October, we've already re seen receipts. Um, well, pretty much for the most of the month of October, I think we have receipts for everyone. Um, and what we've seen so far, uh, some of the early filings have already received biometric appointments and uh, have approved uh, EADs and advanced paroles. So they're going to, and a lot of the EAD and advanced parole approvals are going to be factored into where the person lives, uh, you know, depending on how long or how much demand there is for biometrics. Again, like we were discussing at the beginning of the show for H4 and H4 EAD, uh, the demand for biometric appointments is really going to be a, a governing factor into how soon you can have uh, your advanced parole at EAD. And I know a lot of people are stressed uh, at the moment due to the fact they probably have family uh, back home that might have health issues or anything like that, and they're waiting on these documents so they can travel. Uh, so, you know, we just have to be patient and um, hopefully we, we start seeing more and more approved here shortly. Um, as far as rejections go, uh, we haven't seen any specifically with the, our office like this, but I know I've heard a lot of uh, from other people where rejections have come in where uh, maybe the forms weren't completed correctly um, and the forms were rejected because, and usually I think the common uh denominator with this is going to be for family members where uh, when you have your principal applicant, maybe the employ the person who's currently in H1 that you're filing for, you know, we, we select in the adjustment of status that we're uh, filing for, you know, uh, employment based uh, things like this. And they, from what I've heard, uh, other people have left it blank because they think common sense would tell them that the, the, you know, spouse or kids are, are not going through that process because they're not uh, employment based. They would be derivatives. But USCIS is rejected for those reasons. Um, maybe some other reasons would be uh, the funds not being sufficient with the checks provided, maybe the wrong filing fee amounts. Um, and these are all, um, you know, varied cases. And, and for anything that's happened to anyone, uh, I know it's uh, worrisome. Don't panic. Uh, there's always a solution to every problem. Uh, and you have to, you know, be patient with these processes and, and realize that, you know, we did have uh, a large number of people applying at one time. Uh, USCIS didn't provide much uh, advance notification as far as what uh, 
would be acceptable or not in, in certain you know regards to some of these filings uh, you know and also at the same time in years past if there was something wrong USCIS would return the package but allow you to unless there was something just a tremendous error made they would allow you to resubmit uh, without losing your place in line so a lot of these policies have changed uh, where they're more drastic an example of this is for people who file for asylum status uh, you know under the last president they changed the policy where if one field like your middle name if you have a middle name or not if that's left blank they would reject the whole package so you literally if you don't have middle name you have to put in a or whatever it is for every single field in the application so um you know you're not alone if anything bad happened or the case was rejected it's something that can be resolved it can you know and we can it just takes a little bit of time and uh, patience and we you know we can get everything back on track okay Lucas, uh, you provided a lot of information. Just I need to discuss uh, step by step in the 485, the rejection, adjustment of status. The first thing is, I would like to discuss with you regarding what is 3A and 9B. I hear a lot of, lot of questions. Uh, maybe I, I hear a lot of rejection on this one. What exactly is this? I don't know the fields off the top of my head, but if I were to uh you know uh guess I, w I would expect it's what i just said about uh, there's a field where it's it asked uh you know is this a family based or employment based uh it goes on down to say if it's employment based are you related to you know the petitioner or do you have any ownership interest in the uh the petitioning organization um like i said usually i think you know common sense would tell you uh, that if you're filing an employment-based uh, application for adjustment of status, that you would be looking at the principal uh, applicant and that each derivative, wife and kids, uh, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily say it would be an employment-based, but um, we knew before um, probably the summer of those changes that were made is in that regard. Uh, so we were able to uh, mention that and, and have that correctly done. And I think, again, like I said, it's not the fault of uh, really any other attorney who might have missed that. It's just they might have missed the announcement or news that came through in regards to that field because in the past, that's how it was done. Okay. <clears throat> so what if, uh, let's say, due to the, some misrepresentation or maybe misselection of the op options or maybe parts. So it got rejected for the primary applicant and the mm. derivative applications. Let's say who who are, it means if any application got rejected, those are fall into the uh, 2014 August peer priority date. The current is not, um, uh, priority date is your retrogation to take a, uh, accept the filing. For adjust, adjustment of status, in this case, in this case, will they reapply again on the the same receipt number, or they should be wait until get their priority date to accept the the file filing date? See, so there is the good question. Um, if it's rejected, they don't. There's not an actual receipt number issued to it. Now, in years past. You know, USCIS would look for the completeness of everything. And if you met the requirements, they would open the case, you know, cash the checks and sign the receipt number, and then uh, notify you of the deficiency in the case and allow you through RFE or some other method to go ahead and fix that uh, error. Uh, a lot of that has changed over the past four years where even small errors, it rejects complete package. So... We have, uh, and the reason I've heard a lot of this uh, happening with, with those categories is uh, um, IELA, American Immigration Lawyers Association, is uh, uh, working with the uh, liaison office with uh, DHS to try and see what we can do about, uh, you know, if this happened, a, a resubmission process. So I think that's still in the works of, as far as communication. Um, 
you know, I believe everything should be fine as far as resubmission. I know there's traditional methods of, uh, you know, dunk pro tonk and other things like this where we can show if it's no fault of the, the applicant, uh, they're maintain their non-immigrant status as how it's been before and they're not at removal proceedings that typically that's something that USCIS will accept uh, for the filing. And nunc pro tunc is just a Latin term where it's basically uh, you're going back and uh, basically accepting the filing as if it were filed at that time back uh, at that previous date. So it was filed properly. Okay. So even I see a couple of rejection on the uh, not represented the alien number. Is that uh, important to enter? It meant to uh, provide the alien number in 485 application? Correct. So when you uh, file any type of petition that gives you an immigrant benefit or would give you an immigrant benefit uh, in the future, it, what that means is the government's going to assign you an A number. Now, a lot of people think, well, when I was a student, I also had a number on my EAD and things like this. And, you know, technically that's not true. Uh, there is a, a number that's associated with that, that we use certain times for H1B filings, especially during cap season uh, that allow the you know service to identify that person, not only through their uh, CVS ID, but also through that a number associated with the work authorization. But when you get an A number, it's going to be like a nine-digit uh, identifier, much like a social security number. And, uh, you know, you're, you, this will be associated with your A file, which stands for alien file. And there's actually going to be a physical file uh, categorized under, under your A number, and it's going to have all the petition documents, applications, everything in there. So it's very key if you don't have a corresponding A number to your application, how is the service going to find the previously filed I-140 or associate it with your A file? And like I said, in years past, if you didn't include that, it wasn't something that was fatal to the filing. They would you know, allow you to have a chance to cure that or correct it as long as the majority of the application was there. But now these recent policy changes are, are pretty much saying, hey, you know, look, I see a sufficient amount of information Yeah, sorry viewers, uh, we saw some issues and connection issues and uh, we are back. Yeah, uh, Lucas, uh, we are discussing 485 adjust adjustment of status. So uh, we saw a lot of rejection on uh, in all segment is a primary and a derivative and uh, kids also. The one question is I saw it. Hey, uh, the fee is uh, different to each applicant is a primary and uh, derivative and cater? So the adjustment fee is for applicants that are derivative uh, and also the primary uh, applicant is 1225. Uh, there are, it, it, so if you're over a certain age, I think the fee is 750. And if you're under a certain age, the fee is 750. So for the most part, everyone qualifies under the 1225 uh, fee. Yeah, okay. So why it is um, approved? It means God recept God receptive primary and uh, dependent spouse and the uh, kid God is uh, rejected actually due to the in incorrect payment uh, information. Uh, yes, in regards to you were saying the. Uh, what does it mean? Yes, why it is um, rejected the kid derivative 485 adjustment of status? Well, it's something that needs to be cured with the correct filing fee. Um, and then usually uh, with a non pro tonk or something like this, it can be resubmitted and the receipts being issued. Okay. Lucas, uh, give me a second once again. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry viewers, uh, I see that some the network issues and uh, 
the all streaming applications got disconnected and restarted. Unfortunately, oh, okay. YouTube YouTube link got disconnected and uh, Facebook is streaming. Just um, you can follow the Facebook link and uh, get more information on the next uh, show, next uh, coming questions and answers. So, Lucas, um, let's say I have a scenario for the 485. The same thing already you discussed. Um, and just I want to touch base of the one, uh, the H1B holder sent a question. Uh, he's saying this my derivative application uh, application got rejected for additional airline information needed, alien information needed. The question is nine nine A was left unanswered. Now that PD is not current, can I still update the forms or resend the derivative application? as a primary was accepted. So on that regard, uh, like I said, there's two things happening right now. The ILA is reaching out to coordinate to see, you know, uh, about that. And then also there's the, another provision that's always available. Uh, it's not 100%, it's at the discretion of the USCIS, like I said, with the NUNC pro -tunk submission. So, um, you know, it's something, that, you know, where I think, as far as those other, the 9B box and the other selection to say that you're uh, employment based, I think there was probably quite a few where they had that same issue. So I, I, I'm hoping that uh, things will be resolved in a way where we can maybe keep all the packages together. So if primary was accepted and derivative was not, that there's a way that we can uh, cure that in the future. Okay. So I have the one more question on the same 485 adjustment of status. He applied in October 2020 filing receipt, receipt number as some of it means he's talking, he's the question about the centers with the mm -hmm. um, names. So the receipt numbers are some of us that received MSC receipts and few of their friends received the LIN and SRC. So right. what is the MSC Service Center and the what basis these receipts are being issued by USCS? So that's the National Benefit Center. Uh, and if you file I-140 and downgrade, or if you um, and your petitioner is in a certain region or area, it goes to the Texas Service Center. And if you file I-140 downgrade and your petitioner is in the other regions, it goes to the California uh, Service Center. Or uh, I'm sorry, not California. It goes to... Um, California goes to the Nebraska Service Center, which is LIN. So SRC means Texas, LIN is Nebraska, and the MSC is the National Benefit Center. So it just depends on what type of case you have. And if you downgrade it, it's where your petitioner's uh, office is located and which state it is. Okay. So in this, um, uh, I have a note on this one, the center. So I see a one... Uh, the 485 application adjustment of status, the both the wife and uh, primary applicant and the spouse, the receipt numbers got from the Texas Center, but kid application went to MSC Center. Is there any time, it means, is there any age period to um, divide the application and the process different uh, centers or something? Or it's that's going to be in, in regards to the biometrics, right? So biometrics for kid under a certain age is not required. Uh, okay. What so is the why, age? What is the age? Uh, 14. Oh, under 14, they don't. Correct. Okay. They don't have the biometric. Okay. So in this case, uh, that's why the fees is different or something. We apply yeah. for the biometric. We added the $80 for biometric ADA. process. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I think... Uh, yeah, is a. I think it's good information. Lucas, we got a question from Facebook. Sujit, Sujit, uh, I'm recent graduated student and looking forward to my first job. I had lost my I lost my initial card with the USPS and had to apply for the for the replacement card seven sixty five. 
I having offers from the other companies, but unable to work because I don't have the physical card. Is there any way I can expedite my case with USCS? If S, can you explain the options? Yes, so this happens time to time. Um, unfortunately, if you're OPT or STEM OPT, you won't be able to work on uh, unless you have the physical card in hand. Um, if you're CPT, obviously you wouldn't have a card. You would have just the I-20. It's very important that you consider this you're just because you don't have a card doesn't mean your unauthor your unemployment period is not counting against you so under different uh, factors if you're in post completion stem or whatever you, you have to maintain a certain amount of hours worked now you can always do training or unpaid internships or things like this with your petitioner and it's very important that you Make sure you communicate or at least try and get one of those positions. Uh, and obviously, as soon as USCIS uh, resubmits the EAD card, that would help out tremendously as far as if you haven't ever had a, your SSN, you can get all that set up or uh, go ahead and start working somewhere. Now, what you need to do is also, um, in the past, it was easy to call the 1-800 number. Uh, now, everything's pretty much directed to the website. And... And what you have to do is go ahead and, um, uh, you know, put in your e-request and then wait on, on an officer to make, maybe make an assessment for that. Uh, you might get lucky if you try and call the customer service hotline to see if they can expedite. But unfortunately, you know, th this has been getting more and more difficult over the past six months to get a hold of an officer, communicate directly. So uh, just keep... Um, you know, keep trying the best you can to get in touch with someone so you can expedite it. Okay, yeah, thank you. Lucas, uh, as for my knowledge, we will give the biometric for L2 authorization card and uh, J2 authorization card, but not uh, H4 EAD. So this biometric is mandatory for GC EAD? Or is there any option to skip the biometric? It's It's been mandatory. It is mandatory for the GCEAD. Um, and that's just more or less, you know, you're, you're doing a background check. Uh, that's the purpose of the biometrics. And, uh, you know, um, in the past, that was not a requirement for H4. And I think we see why now, because, you know, USCIS is not opening more and more centers to do biometrics so the <clears throat> the queues the lines are getting much longer uh, so i think it would be nice to have everyone go through the biometrics in that regard but in the in the same sense like we've discussed multiple times we have to look at what a practical solution would be uh, you know there's so many people that need the service and then there's only so many spots so it's it's something that has to be balanced and, and taken care of uh, from the government, from the agency, this viewpoint. Okay. Yeah, Lucas, I have a interested scenario on H4, the H4 application and H4 EAD. The one H4 applicant, uh, the current uh, validity until March 25th, 2021. He applied the extension for H4 is under under process, but uh, his H4 EAD the validity uh, until June 30. Let's say here's the dilemma. It means the current H4 process is uh, under process, but uh, EAD validity until July June June 30. Whether he continue even I-94 expired after May 25th to continue the job to until June 30? Uh, I've never really seen a scenario for that happen, but as long as uh, you have a, a pending uh, I-539 uh, requesting a, a, an extension of stay, you're maintaining your non-immigrant status, obviously as long as the principal non-immigrant still maintaining their status. And if your EAD allows you to work until that time, then obviously you can continue working. There's no 
uh, requirement of I-94 to work with that visa category. The authorization for you to work is, is actually issued through uh, the EAD itself. So by, by that category C-26, it authorizes the user to work. Um, obviously, if you complete an I-9 form, which is what's the requirement from the government to prove the abil ability for that person to work, you would have your uh, passport and EAD card. So if, the, if there was a scenario like that, uh, you know, you need to make sure you maintain your status just so you don't fall out of status. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's not, there's no requirement to have an approved H-4 to have to work on H-4 EAD. Yeah, even now, I, I, I saw this scenario, a little surprise. I don't know how the, the agents are giving the two different. Um... Well, Sometimes what happens is someone will travel, and so like let's say you know, I I'm come back in as an H four uh, holder at first. I have an H four approved until that later date you said with EAD, and then I leave and I come back in, and the officer gives me a shorter period of duration. That happens sometimes, uh, but typically, you know, uh, the dates always match. Okay. Then we come back on topic of a topic the, about the comprehensive immigration, Biden right. comprehensive immigration. Do you see any update the last couple of days? I've seen it quite a bit. I've seen there's a lot of news in regards to, um, you know, especially within our association, um, AILA, there's, there's been a lot of information where we're trying to have open channels of communication with all of our clients and notify them through social media or whatever it might be the the pending changes that are coming now we've already heard about the deferred action for childhood arrivals uh certain things with people seeking asylum uh certain people who are in removal proceedings and the changes that are proposed um, obviously there's hundreds of other issues that we need to address and fix one of which is the employment-based uh, backlog for people from India, China, uh, in regards to those uh, employment-based categories. And I think, uh, you know, what we're going to see, and it's going to happen pretty quickly. We all know, uh, we heard the news here lately, we have uh, an impeachment trial that's going to occur for Donald Trump, uh, you know, which, you know, is, is kind of taking away a little bit of the limelight and the, and the forward momentum. Uh, that was there for for these changes, but I think, you know, hopefully after that's done, when when we really have a debate about what's happening with this comprehensive immigration reform, uh, we start to see how that takes shape. Now, there's a lot of pieces that can move and change uh, in this process, and I think uh, what is beneficial to most of our listeners who might be in a group of employment based is I think it's easy to say if there's any senators on the fence about whether they're going to afford it or not. I think it's easy to, to say, like, you know, we have high-skilled workers, we have people contributing to, you know, tech, big tech, and all the, these factors. And I think that, you know, if there are any compromises made, I don't believe it will affect this group. Uh, I think you're really going to see uh, a lot of progress made in terms of, uh, pathways to citizenship um, and maybe those pathways you know have temporary green cards in them for other category for other people maybe that that pathway works the same way for a lot of our employment base you know we just don't see uh what the 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 actual pieces of you know the working parts are at the moment but there's a lot of ideas a lot of ideas that have shown that this problem is a, a serious problem and that it's going to be addressed and you know, you and I have spoke, Ben Cat, last week. You know, let's reach out and coordinate with, uh, you know, American Telugu Association. Let's coordinate with uh, local representatives, senators. Let's email, message, call them. You know, let's say, look, you know, we, I'm in this situation. Please, if if this is up on the table, I want to address this issue. Uh, so we'll know more and more in the next couple of weeks. But I, I'm I'm very positive and. Uh, excited, and I w if I were to put a uh, percentage of something happening, I would say we're in the high eighty percent, low ninety percent of of this uh, really impacting and helping clear this backlog. 
Okay. But one one question, uh, Lucas, from my side about the maybe 485 green card about the con comprehensive immigration. What do you think? Did you did you did you get any information from ILA? What is going to be implemented for provide wow. or given green cards to backlog? You see, the as we discussed in the past, um, what we're talking about increasing the per country quota, right? The allotment under these categories. That was what the previous uh, bill, you know, we discussed a few weeks ago was addressing. Like, hey, over a period of uh, years, we're going to increase the quota to help diminish this backlog. Well, you know, that that bill is just an amendment to another bill. It's a small piece of the pie of the puzzle that goes to our overall immigration code. Um, what this would be is there's nothing that that can, that has to stay or that can't be changed uh, when we're looking at. That's why we say when it's comprehensive, we're going to fix all the problems the best we can at the moment. Uh, and Congress has the authority; they could say, "Look, anyone who's had uh, I-140 approved more than." Uh, two years and, and the visa is not available, that a visa will be available to them, you know, or they can say that they can issue up to 1 million extra visas to help cure this backlog. There's a, there's a numerous different uh, avenues we could have to get this problem fixed. So just, I remember everyone getting excited and had their hopes uh, on this other uh, bill that went through to the Senate this, this past uh, month, six weeks ago. But, but that was a small patch that really, in my opinion, was going to cheat uh, a lot of people who's been um, maybe in, uh, enduring uh, while this backlog continues to grow. Uh, and I think that really this spring, uh, and we should really see movement probably by the early part of the summer to show, hey, look, this is kind of how the plan's coming together. And then as, when we get to that stage, obviously, it's even more important to you know, reach out to our representatives and say, look, I really need this. I have a kid who might be a U.S. citizen. I have a, uh, a house. I have two cars, American dream. Um, and I have I do not have sustainable day to day knowledge or, or ability to stay here with, you know, my any day my visa could be revoked or something could happen. And, and it leaves our family you know, kind of upended in, in chaos. And we're not able to plan our retirement. We're not able to plan what our kids' future is going to be. And, and that's something I, I really believe is a on a one-to-one, -one, you know, situation where you discuss that and explain your story to someone. I think that, you know, that no one would think that it's okay for someone today who gets an I-140 approved that it's okay to wait 70 years before you get GC. It's just uh, obnoxious and, it, and it's really... Uh, you know, kind of a, a torture in a sense of knowing you can get a benefit, but you don't, you won't be able to get it for a long period of time. Okay. Yeah, hopefully we'll see in the next couple of months. So uh, with the uh, updated information, the green card backlogs. Um, look, yeah, look, uh, so can you share if anything you want to today is any other than what we discussed today? Maybe you if you can share if anything we missed today's session. Well, I think um, one key common thread that we've been discussing over the past few months is uh, with any hope or optimism or or any worry or or anything. I think patience goes a long way. I think. Um, you know, just because something might have happened or something good or bad, it doesn't mean it, everything is, is extremely the best or extremely the worst. We have to keep it even kill until we get to the finish line. Finish line means uh, having GC in hand or whatever other benefit it might be if you're waiting to become citizen or getting a student visa or waiting for H1 and the cap. I think you have to have a thought process where you can't, rely too much on, um, you know, a day-to-day -day feeling because you're going to have ups and downs throughout the journey. And it's a long, it's a long path and it's not a fast 
uh, race or anything like this. It takes years. And I think uh, keeping everything in, in, in that mindset of knowing that, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward and having patience with this, I think that's going to help uh, make sure you're not going to have any extra gray hairs or, or have too much stress. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, there's things we look at now, what we can control and do for today. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And uh, the one thing I tell all my clients and, you know, message boards, our platform that we have here uh, is a great asset, a great tool, a great way to spread knowledge. Uh, but at the same time, everyone's unique and we don't want to rely on what happened to friend here or uh, this happened, you know, to this guy I know, or this was in face, Facebook group or WhatsApp and, oh my goodness, the same thing's going to happen to me or why is this going to happen? And, you know, to have that kind of dread or worry before you even know what the result's going to be for yourself, I, you know, I think um, we would all feel a lot better if we just had, a, you know, slowed down a little bit, had patience and worked through the issues and uh, got to the finish line together. And I think, you know, that's, if I can leave a thought today, that's what I would suggest is just patience and and, and not to stress out too much about anything. Okay. I think we need to build the patient first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, I think uh, we, can, uh, we can close the session today now. But before we end the show, we sincerely apologize to everyone who was viewers and listeners. We had a connection issue in between the show. And so we apologize from, from our technical team. So in future, we, we, will, we, will, we will try to broadcast in uh, high quality and uh, without interruptions. We sincerely apologize on this one. So thank you everyone today who participated and who sent the questions and uh, keep it. And so we are requesting to everyone, please be participate every Wednesday show and get more information on U USA immigrations. That has uh, uh, Lucas said is uh, be patient. So wait uh, until your maybe receptor, maybe the your packet will maybe your uh, get EAD or advanced payroll. Be patient. Uh, after that, uh, you can enjoy when you get this EAD and uh, advanced payroll. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have any questions or if you want to know more information on any USA immigration scenarios or topics, you can send an email to info at bgimmlaw.com. So if you have any complicated um, situation, if you have any complicated scenario, don't hesitate and uh, call to us or send to email to us. We will try to help you and we will try to guide you to get um, educated and uh, take a right direction you were uh, on your on in your scenario so we are requesting to everyone send an email don't just it simple send an email to info at the rate imm law.com lucas will ready to give the appropriate uh, um, the transparent information on U.S. immigration based on your scenarios and your situations. So, yeah, today we are going to be end the show now. We will continue this show every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. G good night and uh, maybe good evening and good night until next show. Bye bye. We will uh, we will connect and uh, next Wednesday. See you on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time on next next week. Thank you. Thank you very much.